title, and we're delighted to have the ambassador. It's simply and straightforwardly United States-Brazil relations under Presidents Obama and Lula. So uh, that provokes a lot of thought immediately, and we're very interested in, in uh, what the ambassador will have to say to us about it. Very quickly, in looking at, at his resume, um, he's had an interesting career, I think, at every point. Uh, it's covered uh, all facets of the diplomatic world. I didn't see anything that was really left out. And he's always been close to the seat of power, it, it appears. Uh, he's a, uh, he did his, uh, he majored as an undergraduate, University of Geneva in philosophy. And uh, so often, students of philosophy do well in their later careers and in graduate schools. He's a graduate of the uh, Brazil's uh, Diplomatic Academy. And as most of you know, a lot of people feel that there's no finer diplomatic service in the world than that of Brazil's. His reputation is extraordinary. His early assignments uh, were, first of all, to uh, uh, their mission and unit, uh, to uh, uh, international organizations in Geneva, then political counselor Beijing, economic counselor Caracas, and then to uh, back to the to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, where he served as a uh, deputy advisor on diplomacy to the pre then President Franco of Brazil, and he served also as an advisor to the Under Secretary for uh, Political Matters. Uh, five years at the United Nations, uh, during which time he was political counselor, but he also was a member of the delegation to the Security Council. And also during that time, he did his advanced work at the Diplomatic Academy. His dissertation was published. It was uh, after the Gulf War, uh, articulating a new paradigm for collective security. That in itself is an interesting topic, of course. <laughs> Then three years at the World Trade Organization, where he was deputy permanent representative, and then uh, with the rank of ambassador uh, to uh, two very senior posts within the Ministry of Foreign Relations. Uh, and uh, as adjuncts to that, he was most recently also responsible for Brazil-United States relations. And he also, before that, was a uh, chief of staff to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. So in a nutshell, it's a career which is extraordinarily interesting. Uh, one doesn't have to overstate in any way uh, the qualities of our, our speaker. And we all look at Brazil today as one of more than an emerging country, a large country, almost as large geographically as the United States, substantial population, rich in resources, and uh, booming as much as anyone booms at this particular moment. Uh, in the international economy. And as we look to a redistribution of political and uh, of economic and political power, uh, Brazil certainly is, is benefiting from these changes in the world. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to present Antonio Patriota, Ambassador of Brazil to the United States. Thank, thank you so much for that very comprehensive introduction. Uh, I feel that nothing was left out. <laughs> Perhaps only the fact that I'm married to a US citizen, uh, Tanya Patriota, uh, and she is doing work for the United Nations right now in Haiti, a country right near here. And I have two sons, Miguel and Thomas. Um, but it's a real pleasure for me to be in Baltimore. Um, I was born in a seaport, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Oh, it doesn't go. It reverberates. No, it's this is better? better? Like this? That's much better. OK. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope, well, you didn't miss anything. It, nothing subs very, very essential was said in the first few sentences. But I was just going to start to saying that it's always a pleasure for me to be at a seaport. I was born in a seaport myself, Rio de Janeiro, uh, in Brazil. Uh, and um, uh, I'm always pleased in being in Washington that Baltimore is right next door. And uh, we've, uh, we've had uh, constant uh, affairs uh, uh, or uh, issues here with uh, Baltimore, uh, whether it's a um, uh, military Brazilian ships that come here to visit. Uh, there are um, Brazilian artists who come to perform here, and recently Nelson Freire, a 
a world famous Brazilian pianist, played at the Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, I believe, uh, with uh, your symphony, and it was a fantastic. I was here, uh, so I can say that it was an extraordinary performance. A trade uh, with Baltimore has been doing very well. Uh, in fact, uh, our exports to the, to the United States through the port of Baltimore have increased by close to 9% from 2007 to 2008. But uh, U.S. exports to Brazil through Baltimore have increased by more than 100% in the past two, three years. So um, going from around $430 million to around $1 billion. Uh, so as we see, there is a very dynamic relationship uh, that goes through Baltimore. And uh, we would indeed be very happy to see this enhanced. There are um, quite a few Brazilian citizens who live here in the region. Um, as far as our, our count goes, uh, several hundred, perhaps close to a thousand, and I know that they uh, are very actively engaged in many of the activities that Baltimore is famous for, uh, including some of the medical, the very e excellent medical uh, institutions, and, and Johns Hopkins in particular, that you have here. Um, but uh, in um, approaching the subject of, well, Brazil-U.S. relations uh, at the time of Lula and Obama, Maybe I can start by giving you a, a brief picture of where Brazil stands today in 2009. Um, this is the sixth year, or is it the seventh? Six and a half years since President Lula has been president. He took office in uh, January 2003. As you know, the first uh, working class president of Brazil. He was a metal worker, a union leader, who tried to uh, reach the presidency three times before he finally uh, um, won the elections in 2002. Um, someone who is a very committed Democrat, uh, he um, became a popular figure in Brazil during the years of military dictatorship uh, when, uh, along with many other leaders who are today in positions, uh, important positions in Brazil, um, uh, struggled and uh, uh, fought through peaceful means for Brazil to go back to uh, full democratic rule. So we're very proud of the fact that today Brazil is a consolidated and, and vibrant democracy, and President Lula has been, well, an active uh, leader and participant in, in this process. Um, maybe less well known in the United States is the fact that uh, in, in other um, realms of our political life, there has also been considerable renewal. So we uh, are roughly the same size as the United States. Actually, if you exclude Alaska, Brazil is slightly larger than the continental United States. But we are divided into fewer states. Uh, uh, we have 27 states for a roughly similar area, um, with some indeed very large states in the Amazon region, uh, in particular uh, a region that is um, re relatively little populated with around 20 million people. Our population uh, globally is 200 million people, so 100 million less than, than the United States, but still that makes us the second largest uh, population-wise in the Americas. Uh, but I was going to mention that um, in many of these states, if not practically all, uh, one witnesses today also the emergence of the new kind of leadership that Lula represents at the federal level. Uh, younger, uh, business-friendly, uh, democratic and committed to um, transparent and good governance, uh, which is a, a very important development because for um, some previous decades, and I remember when I was younger in Brazil and in some of the states of the Northeast, for example, uh, the rule was more to have oligarchic type leaders, uh, very often uh, uh, prosperous families, influential families that would dominate uh, the political scene, not that this is completely alien to us or to the United States or other countries, uh, but the truth is that there's much more opportunity today uh, in Brazil, including for uh, careers in, in politics. And I think that is a good symptom of a healthy uh, political environment. Uh, when one looks at the Brazilian economy, uh, what stands out is the fact that we've overcome some of the very negative traits that we were famous for back in the 80s and 90s, galloping inflation and recurrent uh, debt uh, crisis. Uh, today, uh, inflation is under control. Uh, last year, it was at around 6%. Um, this year should be a little lower, which means quite under control uh, for a, a country such as Brazil in particular, and a big victory when one thinks of the periods when you had 30% inflation a month, and this was not so long ago. 
Um, and when one looks at the macroeconomic situation, well, it is one of stability and, and progress. Uh, we have gone from being a country subject to recurrent financial crisis to one uh, uh, where we are today a um, modest creditor nation with reserves of uh, more than 200 billion US. Um, the rate of growth for the economy during the six years of Lula was between four and five percent, which is a high rate for an economy such as Brazil. It may be slightly low if you compare with India or China, but the truth is that the process that India and China are going through today uh, uh, is a process that we went through in the 70s, namely one of absorbing most of the rural population into the mainstream of the economy. So it would have been a little bit um, um, unusual if, if we would manage uh, growth rates such as India, China are experiencing today. Four, five, six percent is high for an economy that has reached the degree of maturity uh, that Brazil has reached. And of course, foreign trade has become extremely important. We practically multiplied by three um, our two-way foreign trade since President Lula took office, which was 2003, as I mentioned, um, and with a diversification of trading partners. Um, just to give you uh, an idea, it used to be that uh, the United States, for example, represented more than 25 percent of our uh, trade. Today, it's closer to 16 percent. It's still um, probably the number one trading partner, although China now is very close uh, to the United States. Last month, China overtook the United States. We don't know for the entire year what the statistics will be. Uh, but one of the reasons that we've managed to uh, maintain a high rate of growth for our exports uh, and also a uh, quite considerable increase in imports, and I'll come back to that later, uh, is the fact that we've diversified uh, considerably. Uh, there's a lot of talk today that Brazil is no longer a country that only has regional influence, that it has started uh, having global outreach. And well, indeed, when one looks at our economic and trade uh, cooperation, uh, the outreach is truly global. Uh, the currents of trade with China are, are very strong and other countries in, in, in Asia Pacific area. Um, uh, with Africa, we have developed also much closer relations than we used to do. And uh, today we have a large number of embassies um, in China. Just to give you an indication, under President Lula, 35 new embassies were opened around the world and more than 20 of these are in Africa. Uh, and this has also generated uh, much more of an interchange with the private sectors of uh, several African countries, although uh, comparatively less uh, prosperous uh, economies, but still very important markets for Brazil and relatively close geographically. Uh, and of course, South America has become a focus of priority attention. Um, uh, I often mention here in the United States that uh, we tend to break up the Americas in, in ways that are not obvious to a North American or, or uh, a citizen of the US who uh, often use the expression the Western Hemisphere. Well, we tend to see the Americas more as a collection of subgroups, uh, North America, of course, uh, comprising United States, Canada, and Mexico under NAFTA. And then you have the Central American uh, um, integration process, CARICOM, bringing together Caribbean countries. And more and more, we are working to promote South American integration. Now, in ways that uh, uh, may seem that many in the North American part of the, uh, the Americas take for granted, uh, you can move from uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific without too much trouble uh, through railroads and roads, um, of course, air travel. But the truth is that in South America, it's relatively difficult to go uh, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. There is, of course, the Andes, the high mountains, the Cordillera, which is the equivalent to the Rocky Mountains here in the US. And historically, there had been a comparatively little contact between the Brazilian um, uh, populated areas on the Atlantic and the uh, Spanish-speaking populated areas on the Pacific. Well, this is being quickly overcome through a um, concentrated effort at developing uh, road networks, uh, communications, uh, common energy policies um, that have culminated in the creation of what we call UNASUL, the South American uh, Community of Nations. Uh, the statute for UNASUL was adopted last year, and subsequent to that, uh, another um, mechanism, uh, namely the South American Defense Council, uh, was created. 
Uh, and this also re represents, well, an innovative and interesting mechanism insofar as it allows for uh, all the countries in South America to consult and uh, coordinate uh, on a regular basis on issues that pertain to security. Now, we are fortunately in South America, a region of relative peace um, and democracy. Uh, all countries have democratically elected governments. Uh, we have um, tensions that may spring up once in a while uh, between uh, neighboring countries. Uh, fortunately, these tensions usually don't involve Brazil because Brazil has had the good fortune of having solved all its border issues with its 10 neighbors as early as 1910, so uh, about 100 years ago, 100 years of, um, um, let's say, non-controversial uh, coexistence with 10 neighbors. I think this is probably a unique record worldwide, because if you look at any other large country in the world that has 10 or more neighbors, they are bound to have difficulties with some of the neighbors. Um, I, I don't know if I need to give some examples, but if you think of India and Pakistan, if you think of uh, China and, uh, and India so, to some degree, Russia and the Caucasus, North Korea is a problem. Well, uh, in South America, fortunately, uh, when there are tensions, they are uh, solved through dialogue. But this is not to say that there are not, uh, that we don't go through moments of stress. Uh, last year, for example, there were uh, difficulties between Colombia and Ecuador. There is a latent problem uh, involving Bolivia and Chile. Bolivia, Bolivia, of course, having lost its access to the sea uh, in the early uh, 20th century, and this representing a national trauma for Bolivians. So they uh, are bound to uh, insist, and they will not give up uh, trying to recover some form of access to the sea. Uh, so we feel that it's very important that we have a mechanism uh, for all the countries uh, in the region to look at security issues um, so that if problems do arise, uh, we will uh, solve them through peaceful means and through uh, dialogue and negotiation. Um, well, I've, I've already entered to some degree into the, the realm of diplomacy, as I was explaining uh, where we are at uh, economically. Um, but uh, uh, what has become clear, and uh, uh, during the introduction, uh, Mr. Frank Bird, uh, was mentioning the fact that, well, Brazil is much more visible today in the international scene than it used to be. And I think this comes from a, an increase in self-confidence uh, that has to do with uh, these two elements that I was just briefly discussing with you. First of all, our uh, democratic credentials, so to speak, uh, our economic progress, uh, which allows us to look further afield and to look at uh, how to develop uh, uh, cooperative relations with, well, uh, all, uh, all regions of the world. Now, uh, of course, the United States is of foremost importance for Brazil. The uh, United States re will remain for the foreseeable future, at least my career horizon as a diplomat, as the number one economic and military power. So for obvious reasons, um, every country in the world uh, needs to uh, look very attentively and carefully at its relations with the U.S. But in the case of Brazil, I think we benefit from a history of uh, close ties and cooperation. Uh, the United States was the first country in the world to recognize Brazilian independence. Uh, our independence came a little later than yours in 1822, and we had a uh, very different history in the 19th century in the sense that we were a monarchy, the only monarchy in the Americas for, for close to well, um, 1882 to 1888, so that's about 60 years more. Uh, that did not prevent us from developing close relations. In fact, there's a book written about um, how close Brazil and the U.S. were in the early 20th century that is called the Unwritten Alliance. Uh, there was no formal alliance between the two countries, but there was a sense that the two uh, largest uh, multi-ethnic democracies in the Americas uh, had uh, a strong stake in working together and in collaborating together. Um, now, this does not mean that there were not periods of disagreement and, and issues on which we have disagreed uh, throughout our history. Um, just to name a very simple one, uh, the, the Iraq intervention during the Bush years was a, uh, a, an initiative that uh, met with, I would say, almost unanimous disapproval in Brazil, whether you were looking at the uh, right-wing parties, or more right-wing or, or to the left. Uh, nevertheless, uh, President Lula, um, I think, uh, recognized uh, the responsibility, his responsibility as leader of a 
large country that needed to have good relations with the United States and develop a very constructive uh, relationship with President Bush. In fact, I think it was more than just constructive, it was quite warm and friendly, and there were many areas where we started working uh, together uh, through innovative um, mechanisms. I can mention two or three. One of them was the biofuels memorandum that was signed in March 2007, uh, Brazil and the United States being the two largest producers of ethanol um, worldwide, uh, realized that they had uh, common interests uh, in uh, exchanging experiences um, on a bilateral basis, uh, through exchanges of scientists and uh, through learning from each other's experiences. One big difference, of course, between Brazil and the US in this field is that our ethanol comes from sugarcane and there's a national network of gas stations and pumps where you can obtain ethanol in Brazil. So um, to the point where today gas is actually the alternative fuel in Brazil rather than ethanol, more than 50% of the cars uh, going around the streets of Brazil run on ethanol. And not only that, but we have a, 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 a growing, increasingly important automobile industry, in fact, the sixth largest in the world. We've just overtaken France and Spain um, as an automobile producer. A parenthesis, um, this, this uh, industry, of course, was, uh, owes uh, much of its uh, existence to uh, U.S. investment, uh, Ford Motor Company, GM, and others. Um, invested in, in the automobile industry in Brazil in the, in the 50s, and it produced um, very uh, important um, subsidiaries that, that to this day uh, are very active and, and responsible for, for the dynamism of, of this industry. Well, what the point that I was going to make is that uh, close to 90% of the vehicles produced in Brazil today are of the flex fuel, uh, as we call it, kind, or I think you would call them hybrids here, where they can uh, work on either gas or ethanol, any mixture thereof. And um, as I was saying, the fact is that they can uh, uh, acquire or, or fill the pump uh, uh, okay. with, with ethanol in, in any, 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 any uh, station in Brazil throughout the country, which is not the case here in the US yet, but maybe you, you will be evolving also in that direction given the, the great pressures um, well, the unsustainability of the oil industry to, to a certain extent. Uh, so um, under Lula and Bush, there was a common um, desire to enhance the cooperation on the biofuels front, not only looking at the two countries, but also looking at ways in which Brazil and the U.S. could help vulnerable, small vulnerable economies uh, in Central America and, Ca and the Caribbean, uh, in Africa, uh, economies that uh, do not have uh, oil, uh, who uh, spend a large proportion of their GDP on oil imports, but that could be producing ethanol and could be uh, developing some degree uh, of self-sufficiency in, 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 uh, in energy and, and also in using uh, ethanol or sugarcane-based uh, ethanol as a, um, as a base for uh, generating electricity. Um, this is a very new area where we've been working together, and I find a, an exciting one, one that we would hope to continue under the new administration. Um, let me mention uh, two other areas where we've been cooperating. Uh, one of them is simply to, to identify a country here uh, in the Americas that has um, gone through chronic periods of crisis, Haiti, uh, and now there is a um, UN-mandated uh, peacekeeping operation in Haiti uh, that is led by a uh, Brazilian general and with uh, 1,200 Brazilian troops. Uh, this has represented, I think, um, a step forward for Haitians. Uh, uh, security has been reestablished, and we are now trying to look at ways where, um, also in coordination with the United States, we can help uh, this uh, very fragile economy and the poorest country in the Americas to try to overcome some of the, um, the great obstacles that it has to confront on the economic and social uh, area. So uh, the United States has some trade preferences that uh, uh, they have extended unilaterally to the uh, Haitians, and we intend to do the same and to start looking at ways whereby we can, for example, try to revive the textile industry in Haiti. Now, I find this is an interesting example because in the past we've enjoyed good bilateral relationship, but we didn't really used to look at ways where we could team up and help other countries in the region or beyond. And this is something that is happening more and more. Uh, I would also 
like to, to mention to you the um, uh, signing of an agreement between Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and our Minister for the Promotion of Racial Equality at San Santos last March in Brasilia, uh, whereby we will start um, exchanging notes, experience, and trying to cooperate on the promotion of racial equality. Now, this is an area uh, that touches uh, Brazilian and U.S. society uh, very profoundly, the two countries, of course, having been uh, the, um, the two places uh, to which the, the largest number of African slaves uh, came uh, during uh, a series of, uh, of centuries from the 16th century onwards. In fact, in Brazil, it started earlier than here in the United States. Um, Less than a million African slaves came to the U.S., something close to 800,000, uh, but more than four million African slaves came to Brazil. Um, slavery was abolished a little bit earlier in the United States in the 1860s, but the U.S. took a very long time to achieve uh, legal equality for African descendants. Uh, and in fact, now that you've elected President Obama to the White House, maybe we can consider that um, this entire process has come to, uh, has come full circle and uh, uh, new opportunities uh, are, are opening for uh, people of all races in, even in this very equal, comparatively equal society uh, that is the United States. Uh, in Brazil, uh, slavery was only abolished in 1889, which is a little later than here, uh, but after slavery was abolished, uh, there were no um, discriminatory or uh, segregation was not institutionalized in any way as it was here. So uh, for that reason, for many decades, we used to believe that we lived in a racial democracy. Um, but there was some degree of self-delusion in this because when one looks at statistics, uh, the truth is that uh, the people of darker skin in Brazil have worse paid jobs, less education, and, and live in um, in worse conditions. So there's a big effort by the government today in Brazil as well uh, to try to um, correct this imbalance and to overcome this legacy. Uh, and in fact, it's surprising that we should not have established a mechanism with the United States earlier on to try to um, uh, learn from each other's historical experience and try to uh, work out uh, what are the best ways to, to promote uh, better integration and more equality. Um, I mentioned some of the interesting developments over the past few years under uh, uh, the previous administration, but it's obvious that uh, uh, the big challenge now is not only to consolidate what we have achieved, but also to plan ahead and to perhaps um, uh, take advantage of the special affinities that exist between Presidents Obama and President Lula in order to uh, become even a little more ambitious in, in our relationship. Um, now, let, let me uh, say in passing, since we are at a trade center in this building here, that trade between our two countries is thriving. Um, I had made a kind of a mental note uh, before, but this is a time to come back to this, perhaps, uh, that um, while our exports to the U.S. have been growing consistently um, at around 10% uh, a year, last year was 9%, the truth is that U.S. exports to Brazil have been growing at a much faster pace. Uh, last year, they grew uh, by 36 percent, and the trade flow in the two directions uh, reached the uh, historic record of 53 billion U.S. dollars, which is uh, quite representative um, and uh, places us among the 10 or sometimes 11, 12th uh, largest trading partner for the U.S. Uh, not only that, but the U.S. is a very significant investor in, in Brazil, historically um, I, I mentioned General Motors, Ford, and other companies that have been in Brazil close to, uh, well, more than 50 years, uh, but many others that have been there for even longer, and investment keeps pouring in now also in, in some of the newer industries, uh, such as informatics, uh, um, biochemistry, et cetera. Uh, but perhaps more, um, more surprisingly, Brazil has also become an important investor in the United States. Uh, with more than 10 billion uh, invested here in the U.S. Uh, as investment stock, and, and in many different areas. There is Petrobras, the big oil company um, in Brazil that is now present in the Gulf of Mexico with, with uh, headquarters in Houston. Uh, you have Odebrecht, uh, a, a civil construction uh, company based in Bahia, Brazil, that has just completed the new uh, terminal for Miami Airport and is present in uh, several other uh, 
cities in the United States. Uh, the U.S. company Swift, that you are probably all familiar with, has recently been purchased by a Brazilian company from the center of Brazil, who are the number two largest uh, meatpacking uh, company in the world today. So this has created additional uh, possibilities for interaction between our private sectors and, and uh, more people-to-people -people contact. Uh, and I think it's also a sign of a, a very healthy uh, relationship. But I was mentioning the special affinities that bring together Presidents Lula and Obama. And I usually, um, to try to systematize a little bit what, what they have in common, I, I identify three important uh, similarities. Uh, first of all, I think that the two leaders uh, um, have in common the fact that they had to overcome prejudice in their own societies to reach the position uh, that they uh, did reach through uh, democratic means. Uh, in Brazil, uh, social prejudice is strong, uh, and for a worker to reach the presidency is something that uh, would have seemed very unlikely for my parents' generation, for example. So quite an extraordinary accomplishment. And the fact that he's proven to be an extremely wise and, and competent uh, leader, I think, uh, has been a, a, a very positive experience for Brazilian society and a, a society that is more unequal in many aspects uh, than the United States, with more historically more concentration of wealth uh, with a smaller portion of the population. Now, this has started to change, and this is one of the very positive aspects of what is going on in Brazil today. Uh, through some of the policies that President Lula implemented. Uh, extreme poverty has been cut by half uh, in the past uh, five years, uh, and as many as 20 million people have um, migrated from the lower middle classes into um, middle class, uh, middle class here being defined as people who earn around five times the minimum wage. Um, this has not only proven to be morally um, uh, justifiable and, and desirable, but also economically intelligent, because at a time of uh, economic downturn around the world, uh, where um, um, most countries around the world are experiencing difficulties and, and diminishing exports, um, it has proven to be uh, one of the driving forces behind the Brazilian economy, the fact that uh, the internal, the domestic market has been expanding through these social programs. Uh, and this is what explains that fact that we have been um, uh, comparatively, uh, doing comparatively well uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, the effects of the current economic crisis, uh, um, the forecast for this year being low but still positive economic growth, and in fact the forecast for the second semester being relatively uh, uh, positive. Uh, and some people believe uh, uh, the finance minister and the uh, our, our economic institutes looking at 2010 as a re year of full economic recovery uh, in terms comparable to uh, the past five years. Um, so I was mentioning the fact that Lula and Obama, in, in, in many respects, share this uh, trajectory of overcoming prejudice. Another, another similarity is the fact that uh, they, they reach the positions uh, that they did reach, uh, in, uh, the, the the highest elected uh, uh, position in their uh, governments through a, um, a path that enhances dialogue. Dialogue meaning, what I mean by this is that they are men who don't believe only in, um, in communicating with the like-minded. Of course, they are strongly rooted in their own parties, in their own communities, but they have been also uh, men who have made a deliberate effort to reach across to others uh, who think differently. And this both internally and internationally. Uh, it was a, a, an interesting point during the electoral campaign here in the United States whether um, it was appropriate or not for a US leader to, for example, engage with Iran or Syria or uh, other countries with which the US has been experiencing difficulties. And of course, the, uh, the candidate who, who won the elections was one who um, defended the notion that one should at least make a serious attempt at, at dialogue with those who, uh, who think differently. And this is very much the mindset of President Lula. Uh, throughout his career, although he was a union leader, he always enjoyed very good relations with the, um, the, the businessmen and, and the factory owners. 
Uh, in fact, he has many friends among the business elite in Brazil and among the bankers in Brazil even to this day, which has facilitated his task when he was elected president. And likewise, he is um, a strong believer in sitting down and uh, speaking to, to other international leaders, uh, whether he agrees or not uh, with their ideas completely, uh, and trying to engage other countries, even those with which uh, you have difficulties, rather than resorting to isolation uh, or to uh, um, groups of the like-minded. And a third characteristic that I think is pretty obvious in both leaders is the fact that they place great emphasis in improving the lot of the least favorite uh, segments of society. And we've seen that through uh, President Obama's work as a community organizer in Chicago. He could have graduated from law school and gone on to, to uh, win very high salaries at a law firm or at Wall Street, but he preferred to engage um, with the um, difficult uh, neighborhoods in Chicago. And President Lula, of course, um, his life history is one of dedicating himself to uh, the, the less well-off in Brazil. And he has never uh, made, um, he has never hidden uh, his priority uh, nationally uh, in terms of uh, affording the, uh, uh, the totality of the Brazilian people, well, conditions of uh, uh, overcoming poverty. Uh, during his acceptance speech, uh, he mentioned that his, he would feel fulfilled if he uh, were capable to uh, help Brazilians all Brazilians to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, this may seem obvious to a relatively prosperous society, but the truth is that although Brazil is a very wealthy country agriculturally, uh, the inequality has led uh, some parts of large cities and some regions of the country to lag behind and to experience extreme poverty and even hunger. And um, I think he has been, um, by and large, successful in this attempt. Uh, and this has also been uh, uh, one of the interesting features of, of uh, his presidency. Uh, as we look ahead, well, uh, first of all, let, we mention, let me mention that uh, uh, the two uh, leaders uh, have already met face to face. There was a meeting at the White House in March that uh, I was present, and it was very obvious to see the good chemistry between them and the broad agreement on practically everything they touched upon, whether it was the economic crisis and how to deal with it, uh, or um, looking at the region and how to um, improve the livelihood of people in the Americas. There was Haiti that came up, uh, the Middle East, uh, climate change, energy, et cetera. Um, by the way, uh, one, one topic that I know interests the American public very much is the fact that Brazil has become energy sufficient. Um, and one of the interesting traits uh, of Brazil, if you compare Brazil with other similar countries, the BRICS countries, for example, Brazil, Russia, India, China, well, Brazil is the only one to be self-sufficient in energy, water, and food, uh, which are three very strong assets. And of course, the energy self-sufficiency came through the investment in the ethanol program, as well as investment in deep sea drilling uh, uh, along the coast of southern Brazil. Uh, Petrobras, the national oil company, having um, been um, at the forefront of this effort and having developed uh, what is considered the uh, most advanced technology worldwide for uh, drilling uh, at very low depths. Um, so uh, quite a bit of oil has been discovered, and this uh, will allow us not only to provide for our own needs, but to become uh, an exporter uh, in, in the coming years. Um, so I was mentioning the, the meeting between the two presidents at the Oval Office and the um, very positive first contact they had. My foreign minister, Celso Moni, has met on a number of occasions with Secretary Hillary Clinton. And one of the reasons I was a little bit late today is because uh, today uh, it was confirmed that she will be traveling to Brasilia on the 29th of May. Uh, and we are preparing for that visit. It will be her first visit as Secretary of State to Brazil. So we, um, we intend to, to make that a success and to look at, at ways where we can <clears throat> improve the uh, mechanisms that we already have to uh, to uh, promote a stronger cooperation on a number of fronts with the United States. Um, the, the two presidents have also met in the context of the G20 meeting in, in London uh, and during the Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago that has just uh, taken place a few weeks ago. Um, and the um, uh, overall assessment by the leaders of the region was that 
President Obama indeed uh, had a very strong performance uh, demonstrating um, open mind and a readiness to engage with countries in Latin America uh, in, in ways that perhaps past leaders of the U.S. Uh, had, had not done before, uh, and uh, demonstrating uh, an ability to listen and to um, um, give, create the impression that uh, the United States is ready to engage with the countries in the region as true partners rather than um, giving them ready-made recipes for how to, uh, to promote their development. Of course, we are in the midst of an economic crisis that was in great part um, originated here in the United States and in the developed world, and this creates an opportunity for countries that have been experimenting with models that um, foresee, uh, let's say, m more participation in, of the state in the economy than uh, it was uh, fashionable to believe in during the 80s and 90s. Uh, um, it gives these, these governments self-assurance that perhaps what they were attempting to do uh, was not entirely irrational. Uh, and in fact, I think what we have to believe in more and more is that uh, different countries have to experiment with different models. The U.S. itself has experimented greatly uh, throughout its history with different economic models, different political, um, uh, uh, not necessarily models. You have been in democracy, and that has been an, an, an inspiration for, for all across the world. But you have gone through constitutional amendments. Uh, you had, for example, a limitless uh, re-election uh, until uh, FDR, and then you decided to limit that to two subsequent terms. Um, uh, what we see today in Latin America and South America uh, is an attempt to find autonomously, independently, uh, what works best for societies. And I think what is very encouraging is that there is a democratic revival and also a sense that uh, if countries do not tackle very seriously and head on uh, the social inequalities, uh, the, the situations of extreme concentration of wealth and extreme poverty, um, their development will not be sustainable, their democracies will not be sustainable. So I guess I, I'll conclude with these words and uh, open up for question. And thank you very all, much for your attention. Well, we, we thank you very much for that. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, I'll repeat them for the benefit of the camera. We, would you? Would you comment, uh, comment sure. upon deforestation in the Amazon? Very gladly. Um, well, I think to comment on deforestation, it's always useful to provide a little bit of context. Um, we are all concerned about global warming, uh, and deforestation is responsible for about 16% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Uh, so uh, the remaining 84% are due to uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, industrial pollution. Um, now, when you come to the industrial pollution, uh, Brazil is in a, a very um, uh, positive place because uh, for an economy of its size, it has the cleanest energy matrix of any country in the world. More than 40% of the energy produced in Brazil comes from renewable sources, meaning either hydroelectric or ethanol-based or wind, or solar, nuclear, um, so clean energy sources. To give you an idea, in the United States, the um, percentage of energy that comes from renewable sources is less than 14. So you're comparing 40% with 14. Um, now, uh, I mentioned that 16% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation, and uh, about half of that, or a little, a little more, has to do with deforestation in the Amazon region, where, um, you know, so it is a Brazilian responsibility. And Brazil is acutely aware of its responsibility, not only nationally speaking, but also internationally, uh, given the role that the Amazon rainforest plays also as a kind of lung for, for, uh, for the world. And the truth is that uh, although deforestation proceeds, uh, there is a growing awareness of the need to, uh, to control it, and we have now established very ambitious targets to not only reduce deforestation, but to replant trees. So uh, the issue here is to uh, find a balance, or uh, as the experts say, uh, uh, reach a point of sustainability where um, uh, for any given number of trees that are cut down, you will be planting and growing a, a similar number or more if possible. Uh, and I think we're on the right track. 
but what is often not known internationally is that even if we stopped cutting any trees today uh, in Brazil, uh, the Amazon rainforest would still be under threat due to the 84% uh, of the pollution uh, worldwide of the greenhouse gas emissions that come from industrial pollution. And in that sphere, the United States has the biggest responsibility of all as the number one uh, greenhouse gas emitter uh, due to industrial uh, pollution. And China is very close to the United States uh, in that category. So um, through this answer, what I'm trying really to stress is the fact that this is, has to be a collective effort worldwide. Uh, where each country assumes its own responsibility vis-a-vis -vis our planet. Uh, fortunately, uh, a, a consciousness and a world consciousness is, is developing very quickly. Uh, and we're also, if I may say so, very encouraged by the appointments that were made here in the United States by President Obama for Secretary of Energy and for other authorities uh, that deal with energy and uh, uh, environmental issues because um, through these appointments he has demonstrated a commitment to overcome and to work uh, constructively with the rest of the international community. An interesting uh, view of an advantage you know, of I, Iraq. If I, if I may uh, repeat the question for the... Sure. Uh, the uh, American uh, uh, participation in Latin America is a negative in this premise, and because we were uh, dropped our interest in Latin America because of Iraq. That was a good that came out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. but, and, and that comes to the question is, uh, how much do the people of Latin America uh, wish American uh, participation in their uh, bailiwick? You know, the, there's an easy way to answer this question, and, and it's through a, almost a slogan uh, that I repeat often. Uh, as, as far as Brazil is concerned, what we are interested in is not in quantity of attention from the United States, but in quality of attention. So, um, but I think this is a, 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 a message that, um, that is very um, uh, ripe with, with, with significance. Um, it's not, w one of the reasons not so much attention is paid to Latin America is that, well, Latin America is a, a region of uh, comparative peace and democratic progress and social development. So it's natural that the headlines and you know, the, uh, the, the concerns of, let's say, the foreign policy uh, uh, establishment in the United States and Congress, et cetera, uh, concentrate itself on either Israel, Palestine, or Pakistan, Afghanistan, or, or other trouble spots in the world. Uh, but I think you are right in pointing out that there is a past of um, um, less than constructive uh, interaction between the United States uh, and Latin America. Uh, at, uh, recently, there was a conference made by Admiral Stavridis, who is uh, the um, American military uh, in charge of uh, uh, the Southern Command, the, the command in Florida that deals with uh, Latin America. And he was the one to point out that historically there, there have been 83 US interventions in Latin American countries, uh, many of them some countries, several interventions, like Haiti, Nicaragua, uh, Grenada, Panama, uh, Colombia. The country of Panama was actually the product of a U.S. intervention uh, uh, because the canal uh, uh, would be more easy to build with, uh, well, a smaller country. So uh, fortunately, Brazil has never been uh, uh, involved in any uh, U.S. intervention in the region, uh, but uh, we did um, let's say, uh, we, we could place ourselves as uh, partly victims, at least, of the military coup in 1964 during the Cold War uh, that um, was responsible for uh, a military dictatorship, quite ruthless at some points, uh, that lasted for more than 25 years. Uh, but, you know, I think the role of the diplomat is to be optimistic and to look uh, to the future and to try to um, learn from the lessons of the past and, and, and build constructively. And, and again, I think the United States is extremely fortunate to have a man such as Barack Obama in, in the White House, someone who is very aware of the more positive and less positive uh, roles that the US has had internationally. In fact, if, for those who have not read it, I would strongly recommend chapter eight of The Audacity of Hope, uh, which you've all heard about, of course. Uh, chapter eight is a, a chapter called The World Beyond Our Borders. And in that chapter, uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, before he was president, precisely makes the point that, well, he had lived in Indonesia as a child, uh, and that it, in Indonesia, he could see the best uh, of what the United States can do internationally, and some of the worst also. 
uh, in supporting um, dictatorships out of a, let's say, uh, uh, perhaps excessive preoccupation uh, with the uh, threats associated with communism and with left uh, wing governments. Um, so I, I think he is a very enlightened leader in this respect. And again, um, uh, we're not interested in more uh, attention. Uh, uh, we're interested in better, uh, more um, constructive attention. And um, a a as I was mentioning before, being equal partners in, in, in uh, efforts to uh, build better societies. Mm -hmm. A specific question. What's going to happen with respect to US tariffs on your ethanol? Well. Um, I'll tell you what, what I think is going to happen. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, President Bush uh, and his brother Jeb Bush, Governor of Florida, were strong uh, enthusiasts as regards biofuels. And they always made it very clear uh, that they uh, were against this uh, tariff on imported ethanol that essentially um, uh, affects Brazilian exports because Brazil is, is the only country with a kind of a scale of production of ethanol who could benefit from uh, the U.S. market uh, in any significant way. Um, and the um, usual explanation we would get was that, well, you know, we can only do so much. This is something that Congress uh, is responsible for, and there's some very deeply ingrained interest in Congress, uh, the Midwest, uh, corn, uh, ethanol-based industries are very... Um, they feel very threatened by the perspective of uh, Brazilian ethanol coming into the United States, so, so they uh, organize themselves to maintain this tariff. Uh, now, what, what I think is going to happen is that increasingly um, corn ethanol is coming under criticism in the U.S. and worldwide because it's much less efficient, much less environmentally friendly than sugarcane-based ethanol. Uh, and many of the companies uh, here in the United States that used to uh, press for the tariff are now starting to invest in Brazil. That's a very interesting development. So a company such as ADM that was very active here with corn-based ethanol is now going to invest more than one billion US in uh, sugarcane-based ethanol in Brazil. So I think at some point the pressure uh, in the Midwestern states especially for the maintenance of this tariff, at least at the level that it is today, 54 cents per gallon, uh, will allow for it to be gradually uh, phased out, and, and the politics here in the U.S. Um, will eventually change. Now, of course, uh, this would benefit greatly from some leadership from the White House and from the executive branch, and we would like to continue to count with President Obama's support in this context. Um, but the truth is that if the tariff were eliminated from one day to the next, this may have a, a problematic effect internally in Brazil. Uh, because for many ethanol producers in Brazil, it may become more attractive to export the, to the U.S., and we may run into shortages uh, domestically. So I guess the conclusion to all of this is that we would like to see the elim elimination of the tariff, but the best scenario for us is a gradual uh, phasing out. How, how can Brazil help the United States in its relationships with both Cuba and Venezuela? Well, I, I was half expecting a question such as that because... <laughs> Most of the time when I have meetings such as this, uh, Venezuela and Cuba uh, show up. Well, in, in, in many different guises. Uh, I, I suppose that the first thing I should say is that um, Brazil doesn't really present itself as an intermediary between two sovereign countries. And the United States has very sophisticated diplomacy uh, for, um, for, for it to, to find the, the best way to to approach uh, these two relationships that recognizably are problematic ones at present. Um, that being said, um, there are some, um, s some uh, areas where Brazil is already playing a role. Now, I, I don't think this is something that can be discussed too openly, uh, so I'll, be, uh, I'll have to be a little bit cryptic. Um, but uh, these were situations that were discussed between our two presidents when they met at the Oval Office. Um, there is a sense in Brazil that um, um, both sides have to try to understand uh, the other side a little better. Um, uh, for example, in the case of Cuba, the United States will very soon be the only country in the Americas not to have diplomatic relations with Cuba. Uh, recently, Costa Rica 
which was one of the two remaining Latin American countries that didn't have relations, established relations. And now El Salvador, uh, with the uh, new president who was just elected and takes office on the 1st of June, uh, El Salvador will also establish relations. So um, in, in many ways, the US is the odd man out. And um, if the rest of the continent can have relations and we are all democratic countries, uh, why will the U.S. be unable to? The U.S. has full and very vibrant relations with China, uh, with Vietnam, with other countries that have similar uh, political regimes to that of Cuba. Uh, and uh, of course, we all know that the reason for the difficulties with Cuba uh, have to do to some degree or to a large degree with the fact that Cuba is very much a subject for internal politics in the U.S., especially in the state of Florida. But some of the demographic, demographics are changing in Florida. Uh, President Obama was elected um, and won uh, the state of Florida, and he didn't have to adopt any uh, strong anti-Castro um, rhetoric uh, for that to happen. So we, we see uh, the stage set for, for an improvement, and likewise in Cuba, some changes are happening. Uh, Raul Castro has demonst demonstrated a more open attitude towards the United States. Of course, there are very strong historical grievances. Uh, the Cuban people and the Cuban government are very proud people in government, um, and I don't think we, we should expect uh, um, uh, radical and immediate change. But to the extent that Brazil can play a role, I think this will be a very discreet role behind the scenes. Some of this is already happening, and we will continue to try our best to, to act as a facilitator. The same uh, happens with Venezuela. There are some examples um, that would be better left unmentioned as well, where we have been working behind the scenes. To, to try to improve uh, the relationship. And we're gratified to see that uh, US and Venezuela will be exchanging ambassadors very soon uh, again. Um, and as uh, your assistant secretary for uh, Latin America declared very recently, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, embassies, diplomats are fundamental, uh, not only for um, times uh, when countries uh, get along and see eye to eye and are, are dedicated to to enhancing cooperation, but also to administer difficulties and tensions and problems. So um, it's essential for uh, the United States and Venezuela to, uh, in order for them to improve their relationship, that these uh, embassies have a, uh, uh, um, uh, an envoy uh, at the earliest possible date. Um, and I am optimistic that relations will, will gradually improve. Dense, open, extraordinarily informative. We thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.